Hi everyone, I'm FlygonHG, and this is the video of my attempts at a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokémon Omega Ruby using only Psychic-type Pokémon. To see what I define as hardcore Nuzlocke rules, check out the description below. But in short, no items in battle, no overleveling past the Gym Leader's Ace before the start of the battle, and we're playing on set mode. The Psychic type is a fun one. Although the type has grown more versatile over the years, the typical Psychic type tends to have incredibly high special attack and special defense, at the expense of paltry physical attack and physical defense. Meaning that some matchups are completely trivial, whereas others can be borderline impossible to break through. Steel types in particular are really tough to handle. But fortunately, there's like, no Steel types in Hoenn, right? Psychic types usually also get access to a lot of coverage moves, and their psychic powers give them some pretty interesting tricks to play with. For example, many psychic types, like Zatu, have the ability to see into the future, meaning that they always know exactly when a YouTube video will cut to a sponsorship segment. This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community where you can find thousands of classes designed to teach you creative skills, ranging from topics like illustration, graphic design, and video editing. I always really like having Skillshare as a video sponsor because so many of their classes are perfect for teaching you the skills you need to be a content creator. I know firsthand because when I was starting out, everything I learned about video editing with Adobe Premiere Pro is from Jordi Vanderputt's Adobe Premiere Pro for Beginners class. And that's just one of the thousands of classes on Skillshare, with new premium classes launched every week. The best part about Skillshare classes is that you can complete them at your own pace and however you want. There's no commitment, you can skip individual lessons if you're not interested, and because Skillshare is focused on learning, all classes are ad-free. So, if you're interested in exploring everything that Skillshare has to offer, the first 1,000 people to click the link in the description below, or use my personal code, will get a one-month trial of Skillshare for free. Thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Now, let's get into the challenge. Just as a quick reminder though, before we start, I play with Species Claws. So I'll be able to re-roll encounters until I get a unique encounter, but I can only use one of each unique evolution line. Okay, now let's see how this goes. My very first challenge run of the Hoenn remakes begins where almost all challenge runs begin, by arbitrarily picking one of the three starters that I can't actually use in the challenge. I pick Mudkip because I'm predictable, and change scares me. After the usual tutorial stuff, I can catch the run's first official Pokémon, a Ralts from Route 202. My Ralts is male, so I name him Xavier. In Generation 6, Game Freak added the Fairy type to Ralts, Curlia, and Gardevoir, making them much better for this playthrough. At level 11, Xavier now learns Disarming Voice, which gives him a super effective move against Dark types, which are otherwise completely immune to Xavier's psychic attacks. This means that the mandatory fight against a Team Magma Grunt and his Poochyanna in Petalburg Forest is trivial, instead of having to obnoxiously rely on getting lucky with Double Team and using Struggle. I tend to hate challenges that heavily rely on Double Team strats, because it's completely luck-based and it just requires very little skill. It's much more interesting for me personally when the optimal strategy doesn't require just resetting until you get lucky enough to dodge attacks. So it's nice that we're able to easily handle this Poochyanna in the remakes. With that, we're out of the woods and in the clear yet, good. Unfortunately for me, Xavier is the only Pokémon I can catch before the first Gym Leader Roxanne, and in order to beat her, I will actually have to rely on those Double Team strats. Xavier is just too weak and a little too frail to deal with both of her hard-hitting rock types without dodging a few of their moves. Fortunately, back in Petalburg City, Wally, the weeniest of the rivals, gave me access to super training, meaning that I can fully max out Xavier's special attack and HP EVs without worrying about overleveling. At such a low level, the EVs don't make a huge difference, but they will let me hit a little harder and be a little bit bulkier, which should ever so slightly tip the scales more in my favor. But still, I will have to get lucky. Roxanne leads with her Geodude, and right away I kick things off with a double team, which works perfectly as Geodude just misses a follow-up Rock Tomb. I decide to go for another double team, and Geodude misses yet another Rock Tomb. So this is what good luck feels like, huh? Kinda weird. I then decide to switch to Offense. I hit Geodude with a Confusion, which does great damage. Geodude does unfortunately then connect with a third Rock Tomb, though. Roxanne then uses a Potion, so another Confusion leaves Geodude in the red. And then we still outspeed, so a fourth Confusion finishes her off and gains Xavier a level, which is okay since the level cap ends at the start of the battle. We won the first round here, but now the real challenge begins as Nosepass comes in, who has significantly more special defense than Geodude. She also outspeeds thanks to the Rock Tomb speed drop, but Roxanne's move choices here are... questionable. Roxanne decides to just hit Tackles instead of going for Rock Tomb, 
So even though she does connect with two tackles, Xavier is able to live long enough to knock out Nosepass and win us the first gym badge on the very first attempt. Nice. From here, we begin our internship with the Devon Corporation, which has me acting as a personal delivery boy for Mr. Stone. This first takes me to Duford Town, where I'm supposed to deliver a letter to his wayward son in Granite Cave. But before I do that, I decide to just quickly take care of Brawly. Thanks to Xavier's secondary fairy type, we quad resist fighting type moves. Not that the resistances really matter, because both of his Pokémon fall to a single confusion apiece. I know I maxed out Xavier's special attack stat with super training, but Ralts is really weak, so I honestly wasn't expecting to one-shot both of his Pokémon. But whatever, brains over brawn I guess. That's badge number two. Okay, so now I head into Granite Cave and deliver Mr. Stone's letter to Steven. In the remakes, Granite Cave has gotten a bit of a glow up, and they at least give Steven a reason for sitting in a cave like some sort of platonic Neanderthal. But it still doesn't really feel necessary for me to be the one to hand deliver this letter. Granite Cave is also home to our second possible encounter, an Abra. But for now, I decide to not attempt to catch one, since if it breaks out of the first ball, it'll just teleport away and I'll be stuck with just Xavier until after the third gym. Instead, I continue progressing through the game. After unleashing my psychic powers on enough random animals, Xavier evolves into Curlia, which is ever so marginally better than Ralts, so cool. This gets me to the fight against my rival May on Route 110. She leads with a Slugma, and I of course lead with Xavier. I decide to start with a double team, which yet again instantly pays off as Slugma misses a rock throw. Then I go for an Echoed Voice. Echoed Voice is a 40 base power normal type move that increases by 40 power after each consecutive use, up to 200 base power. This means that after a single use, Echoed Voice does more damage than Stab Confusion, assuming neutral damage from both attacks. This lets me kill the Slugma in two turns and stay at full health since Slugma just misses yet another rock throw. Whalmer is second, and even at 120 base power we don't one-shot Whalmer with a single Echoed Voice, who then retaliates with a Whirlpool, which doesn't do too much even after the residual damage. A fourth 160 base power kills Whalmer. So last is Maze Grovile. She misses a Pursuit, and we're able to fire off a 200 base power Echoed Voice, though that's still not even enough for the one-shot. Rather annoyingly, Grovile is now sitting in Overgrow range, but she still just goes for Pursuit, which doesn't do much damage, and then we finish her off with one last Echoed Voice. Yet again, we got pretty lucky that we were able to dodge a few attacks there, but that should be the last time that I have to rely on Double Team. With May defeated, I can now head to Verdanturf Town and purchase a Nest Ball, which is a special type of Pokeball that works better for low-leveled Pokémon. Fun fact, a common misconception is that the wild Pokémon's level affects its capture rate when using a standard Pokéball. It just doesn't. A level 100 Pidgey has the exact same catch rate as a level 3 Pidgey. Unless, of course, you're using a level ball or a nest ball. With this nest ball that I purchased, I now have an approximately 80% chance of catching a level 12 Abra before it can teleport, which is much better than the roughly 50% chance of using a Great Ball. So I trek back to Granite Cave, find an Abra, Throw a Nest Ball. And thankfully we catch her. They call me One Ball HG. I named the new Abra Karen Smith. It's like she has ESPN or something. Unfortunately, Xavier's Synchronize ability also gives her a gentle nature, so both of my Pokémon are pretty weak to physical moves. After some training, Karen evolves into Kadabra. The training turned out to be pretty obnoxious because I couldn't switch train her without overleveling Xavier. So I had to teach Karen Thief and just plug away at weak Pokémon. It took forever, but was obviously worth it. I then immediately trade Karen to my Uncle Jim Tendo so that she can evolve into Alakazam. Uncle Jim Tendo tries to keep Karen as ransom, but I threaten to report to his parole officer that he got into another fight with another baby, this time at a Quiznos. So eventually, he trades her back, meaning that we now have an incredibly powerful and very fast Pokémon. And look, free spoons! With our team size doubled, it's now time to take on Watson. Steel types are pretty tough as I mentioned, and Watson has two, so this isn't the best matchup, but I'm hoping that our insane special attack will make up for that. Super training really is a lifesaver here. Watson leads with his Magnemity, and I lead with Karen. I spent a ton of cold hard cash to purchase the TM for Charge Beam from the Mauville Pokemart, so I use it to hit Magnemity for some damage, and to fish for those 50% chance special attack boosts. The first one does give us a special attack boost as Magnemity goes for a Thunder Wave. Paralysis is cured by a Held Cherry Berry though, so on the next turn I use Disable to prevent them from hitting another Thunder Wave. 
This lets me go for another charge beam on the third turn, which gives me another special attack boost as Magnemity then goes for a Volt Switch. This brings in Voltorb, who is relatively harmless, so I decide to go for a third charge beam, which also gives me a special attack boost. Voltorb uses charge, but then I kill the poor sucker with a Psy Beam. Magnemity comes back out. Watson heals with a Super Potion, so a Psy Beam brings them down to their Sturdy. Then another Psy Beam finishes them off. Magneton is out last, but now that we're at plus three special attack with a freaking Alakazam, we do more than enough damage to take them out with a single Psy Beam. Evidently, Watson's Magneton does not have Sturdy. I did get pretty lucky that Karen didn't miss a single Charge Beam, and we got back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back boosts, but we did have a little wiggle room there, even if it didn't work out quite that perfectly. I guess luck continues to be on my side for this playthrough. Despite Karen having an IQ of 5,000, she can't seem to figure out a way to smash tiny rocks, so I have to catch a Zigzagoon in order to continue up Route 111. But once we get through that, we can catch a few new encounters in pretty quick succession. In Meteor Falls, after mashing through some Zubats, I encounter and catch a Solrock, who rather frustratingly also has a careful nature. And no, it's not because of Synchronize, because I led with Karen, who has the ability Inner Focus. This means the Dark Phoenix isn't quite as physically bulky as they could be, but what are you gonna do, you know? After swiftly taking care of Maxi on Mount Chimney, I head to Jagged Path and catch a Spoink, who I name Matilda. She has own tempo instead of thick fat, which would have been more useful for the upcoming gym, but own tempo is still a solid ability. Then I talk to a woman in Lava Ridge Town, and she offers me an egg in this trying time. After walking around with the egg for what feels like hours, it finally hatches into a bouncing baby why not. I name her Eleven. So I switch on the EXP share, and I start trying to level up Eleven until she evolves into Wobbuffet. For part of this, I clear through Flannery's gym trainers. One of them, Ace Trainer Zane, has a Kecleon. You might recognize this Kecleon from some Generation 3 Nuzlocks, where he likes to fire off surprisingly nasty and very volatile Fury Swipes. In the remakes, it seems like Zane's Kecleon has gotten a revamped moveset, but that doesn't stop him from being a finicky asshole. I get so close to wiping here, because Kecleon manages to get a critical hit slash against Xavier and a critical hit Shadow Sneak against Dark Phoenix. I do manage to just barely get out alive though. If Dark Phoenix had missed one of these two rock slides though, Kecleon would have been able to shadow sneak his way through the rest of my team. But with that near death experience behind us, Eleven evolves into Wobbuffet, who's certain to have a gigantic impact on the rest of this playthrough. She's a pretty solid Hail Mary to have sitting in the back if we need her. And who knows, maybe we'll need her against Flannery, since her Torkoal is always really tough to go up against, especially if she gets the sun up. Fortunately, at least Flannery's other Pokémon are really easy to take out. She leads with the Slugma, and I lead with Karen, who starts hitting Charge Beams to see if she can get some of those sweet sweet 50% chance special attack boosts. Slugma sets up a Light Screen and also heals, so I stall out a few turns of the Light Screen by spamming Reflect. An Overheat from Slugma manages to hit Karen pretty hard because it's in the sun. And Karen isn't quite as lucky with special attack boosts this time around, so by the time that Slugma falls, we're only sitting at plus one. However, I did time it right so that Light Screen expires. Torkoal comes in second, and I'm not convinced that a plus one Psy Beam will do enough damage to Torkoal, so I just switch to Dark Phoenix, who at least resists Fire-type moves, though a Sun-boosted Overheat still takes almost half of their HP. A critical hit Overheat will kill here, but I decide to just risk it and hit Torkoal with a Rock Slide, which does over 50%. Unfortunately, Torkoal gets off a Curse, so another Rock Slide leaves her with just a Sliver, but Torkoal then just wastes a turn going for Sunny Day so another Rock Slide finishes off Torkoal. I wasn't sure if Flannery would heal with another Hyper Potion or not here, but given that she didn't, it would have been better to go for the 100% accurate Smackdown. But anyways, with her Ace out of the picture, all that's left is an impotent little Numel, who gets one shot by a Rock Slide. So that wins us the fourth Gym Badge. From here, I get to head to the desert on Route 111 in pursuit of my sixth team member, a Baltoy. I named them Raven. Simone or Teen Titans, that's up to you. Raven has a plus defense nature, and Claydol is pretty bulky, so this is an excellent addition to the team, and will surely be used for many upcoming battles. You know, unless he instantly dies to a doduo with pursuit. Well, as Socrates once said, even the mightiest of God's creatures fall to the smiting blade of overconfidence. Okay, Socrates didn't say that, I made that up, but it doesn't make it less true. Anyways, after that whole debacle, Xavier evolves into Gardevoir at the level cap. So now I have two very hard-hitting special attackers, though they're both still pretty frail to physical moves. 
This makes the next gym leader, Norman, pretty problematic. He has two Slay Kings and a Vigoroth, all of which know normal type attacking moves, and the dark type move Feign Attack, which hits all of my Pokemon for super effective damage except Xavier, who does still take big damage from their stab normal moves. This is not a particularly great matchup, but based on how the previous gyms have gone, we do have one thing going for us. The Hoenn remakes seem to have taken a page out of the Kalos handbook and made the gym leaders stupidly easy, so this might still be doable. Norman leads with his level 29 Slaking, which is impossible, but whatever. I lead with Xavier. Instead of doing damage, Slaking just goes for a yawn, so we get off a Psychic, which just straight up one shot Slaking somehow. I know I have max special attack here, and I'm holding an odd incense to boost the power of Psychic type attacks, but that's still super bizarre. This Slaking has to basically have zero IVs in HP and special defense, and a minus special defense nature. And even then, Psychic is a roll to kill. My docs say that this thing has 20 IVs across the board, but evidently that is just not true. But that certainly makes things a lot easier. As Vigoroth comes in, I switch to Dark Phoenix, because I don't want to get hit by a boosted retaliate or fall asleep. Vigoroth just fails an encore though, making it pretty clear that Norman is doing everything in his power to throw this battle. On the next turn, Vigoroth hits a Feint Attack, which does way less damage than I thought it would. And then Dark Phoenix hits a Rock Tomb to lower Vigoroth's speed. Now that we outspeed, another Rock Tomb is enough to finish off the Vigoroth. So, the higher leveled, but still impossible Slay King comes out last. I switch to Xavier, who takes a bit of damage from a Feint Attack. Then, since Slay King loafs around due to his true aunt ability, we are safe to nail him with a Psychic. I decide to switch to 11 as Slay King uses Swagger. So, I switch out to Dark Phoenix as Slay King loafs. Then it's back to Xavier, presumably on a Feint Attack. But nope, just another Swagger. So I finally switch to Karen on another loafing turn, and then we're able to outspeed and kill the silly monkey with a Psybeam, winning us the battle, which again feels like Norman was aggressively trying to throw. Maybe he's just making up for the fact that he's used his job as an excuse to be an absent father and an absent husband. I'll take it. Thanks, Dad. Well, now we're at the point in the Hoenn remakes where the game just gives the player a level 30 legendary, which can mega evolve. Since I'm playing Omega Ruby, I get Latios, which is technically a Psychic-type Pokémon, but it's also a Legendary Pokémon, which is pretty much categorically banned from my Nuzlocks because they tend to be overpowered. One could argue that they aren't any more overpowered than many of the other Pokémon that I do allow in my playthroughs, but one could also shut up a little bit. I'm not using this thing. Well, actually, Latios makes for a pretty great HM Mule, so I will be using him for that. And so, after trekking through Route 119, where Matilda evolves into Grumpig, it's time to fight Winona. They nerfed her Altaria hard, though, so this fight is pretty easy in the remakes. She leads with Swellow, and I lead with Dark Phoenix. I was worried that she'd go for Double Team, but she just hits a Soft Aerial Ace, and then a Rock Slide takes her out. The non-Dragon Dancing Altaria comes in second. She hits a semi-hard Dragon Breath, and then a Rock Slide brings her into the red. Winona heals, so a follow-up Rock Tomb doesn't kill Altaria, but it does lower her speed. So, a 100% accurate Psychic ensures the kill on the next turn. Third is Skarmory, who threatens with Steel Wing, so I switch to Eleven, who shrugs it off like it's nothing. Skarmory then goes for a Sand Attack to lower our accuracy, and Eleven uses her dashing good looks to hit Skarmory with a Charm. Skarmory then goes for an Air Cutter, which we lock her into with Encore. Then I switch to Dark Phoenix, who now takes nothing from a critical hit Air Cutter. A Citrus Berry also brings her back to almost full HP. Since Skarmory has Sturdy, I go for a Rock Tomb first, as she just keeps hitting weak air cutters. Then an Overheat knocks her out on the next turn. Thanks, Flannery. Pelipper comes out last for Winona. There's like a 90% chance that this dumb thing just goes for Protect, but I switch to Xavier just to be sure. And surprise, surprise, a Protect. She doesn't go for a second one though, so a single Charge Beam nails Pelipper in the face, knocking her out and winning us the 6th Gym Badge. With that, I can head to Lily Cove City, where I'm jumped by my rival for a surprise battle. I had no idea there was a rival battle here in these games, so this could be pretty bad. Especially because I haven't had time to level up my Pokémon after getting to the new level cap. So May's Pokémon actually outlevel me by a few levels here. Fortunately, I did just heal at the Pokémon Center, so I'm leading with a fully healthy Xavier into her Swellow. I decide to switch to Dark Phoenix as Swellow sets up a double team. Swellow then hits a soft aerial ace, and we miss a rock slide. Swellow then uses another double team, which could spell trouble, but we connect with a rock slide and get the one shot. Wailord comes in next. This beefcake, which is also illegally under the level she evolves at, knows Water Spout, which can very quickly do big damage to my team. 
I decide to switch to the most sackable of the bunch, Matilda, but the dumb AI continues as Mei just goes for an amnesia. So Matilda hits a weak Zen headbutt as Waylord goes for a brine instead of a water spout. Very generous. I decide to switch to Psybeam on the next turn, which does more damage than Zen headbutt even after the plus two special defense boost from amnesia. And then Waylord just goes for another amnesia. So I start plugging away with Zen headbutt. After a few turns, Waylord goes for a rest, which is incredibly annoying but I take the opportunity to switch to Dark Phoenix and hit him with a hard rock slide. Unfortunately, that does just shy of 50%, so I switch to 11 on the turn that Waylord wakes up, and she brushes off a brine. Waylord then takes another nap, and we lock her into it with Encore. Then it's back to Dark Phoenix. Now that Waylord is locked into rest, it's safe to start whittling her down with rock slide. Turns out that the first rock slide was a low roll, though, because now two rock slides are enough to fell the annoying gentle giant. This brings in Macargo, so I just hit her with a rock slide, which causes her to flinch. Then another rock slide takes her out. Easy peasy. So, May's Sceptile is out last. I decide to switch to Xavier as Sceptile attempts to detect. Sceptile has a terrible moveset here, and her only attacking moves are Slam and Dual Chop. After tanking a pretty hard Slam, a single Psychic is all it takes to knock her out, winning us the surprise rival fight. So after that, I take some time to relax by the beach and enjoy the view. These games are much prettier than they need to be. As I look out across the ocean, the sea breeze flowing through my hair and the waves rhythmically crashing against the cliff face, I feel at peace. You know, in a world that's always telling you to go, 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 it's important to stop and appreciate the quieter moments in life. Because it's in those moments that you realize things that we normally overlook in the day-to-day -day bustle of life. You realize that you love the people in your life more than you can ever express, and maybe you should tell them more. You realize that life is too short to be filled with hate and spite, and that everyone is just doing their best. You realize that even after watching dozens of my videos, you still aren't subscribed to my channel. Fix that. Call your parents. Be kind to a stranger. Smash that subscribe button. Like these games, life is beautiful. Remember to stop and appreciate it once in a while. Anyways, time to catch some more Pokemans. I start by heading to the Safari Zone, where I can get a Giraffe Ridge. Not only am I stoked to catch a spiritual successor to Beep Beep Pony, Giraffe Ridge will also be really helpful against Ghost-type Pokemon. But I end up accidentally running into a Zatu, which while still a really solid Pokemon, is certainly no Beep Beep Pony. I now fear that Giraffe Ridge may be joining Carbink in a realm forever just beyond my reach. Well, I catch Zatu and name him Bran Stark. Fitting name for a disappointing Pokemon, isn't it? I also head to Mount Pyre and catch a Metatite, who I name Carrie White. With her high physical attack stat, she'll be an important player in this tale of iron will. Then, after what feels like hours of fishing, I fish up a Staryu, who I name Starro. Staryu is not a psychic type, but their evolution, Starmie, is. In the original Ruby and Sapphire, you wouldn't be able to get the water stone needed to evolve Staryu into Starmie until after the seventh gym. But in these remakes, you can actually get evolution stones as a reward from secret super training. So, after a few rounds of channeling Roy Kent with Xavier, I get my grubby little mitts on a water stone, which I immediately use to evolve Starro into the part psychic type Starmie. Carrie also evolves into Medicham here, though at least for now, she's gonna stay on the bench. That's because it's time for the seventh gym fight against Tate and Liza, who are significantly easier in Ruby and Sapphire than in Emerald since they only have two Pokemon. I kinda wish the remakes took more from Emerald than Ruby and Sapphire, but whatever. They send out Lunatone and Solrock, and I send out Karen and Starro. Karen fires off a Shadow Ball into Solrock, which leaves them with the sliveriest of slivers of HP. So Starro finishes the deal with a Brine. This just leaves Lunatone, who sets up a Light Screen. But even with the Light Screen setup, they aren't able to survive the double up from Shadow Ball and Brine, so almost as quickly as it was started, the battle ends. That's the 7th Gym Badge acquired. So now it's time to stop Team Magma from unleashing Relentless Sun onto the world. The final battle with Maxi is actually a bit more difficult in this game than in original Ruby, but it's still not as tough as the Lysander fight in X and Y. The level cap also only increased by one level here, so I do have to be careful not to overlevel. Maxi leads with Mightyana, so I lead with Xavier. Xavier then takes out the Mightyana with a single Dazzling Gleam. Maxi then brings in Weezing. I gamble a little bit and bet that Weezing isn't bulky enough to survive a Psychic, and I'm correct. He goes down in one shot. So Crobat is third. This Poison type is faster, so I have to switch out. Dark Phoenix gets hit with a mean look, again proving that this game's AI sucks. 
Crobat then uses an acrobatics for a little bit of damage before falling to a single rock slide. Maxi's Camerupt is last. He Mega Evolves the Big Oaf, which has the potential to be pretty scary, but then we just hit him with a critical hit Stone Edge before he can get off a single hit. Kinda lame, but what are you gonna do? That wins us the battle. But it doesn't stop Maxi from unleashing his son Pocalypse. So I have to clean up his mess by riding Groudon into an ancient cave thing. This is a pretty cool scene, but I can't be the only one who was disappointed to find out that Groudon is only marginally taller than a 10-year-old, right? That Celebi movie set up some pretty unrealistic expectations, I guess. Anyways, after some cutscenes, Groudon digivolves into their primal form, I catch them with the Master Ball, Sutopolis turns into a Tide Pod that explodes, and radioactive waste scatters all over Hoenn. All in a day's work. So, with the world saved, I can now fight Wallace for the 8th and final gym badge. He leads with a Love Disc, and I lead with Starro, who instantly kills Love Disc with a Thunderbolt. Whiskash comes out next, but Starmie has a pretty good moveset and is able to nail Whiskash with a Grass Knot. The Goofy Boy is on Weight Watchers though, so Grass Knot isn't a one-shot, which lets Whiskash retaliate with an Earthquake. Starro tanks it pretty well though, so another Grass Knot finishes off Whiskash on the following turn. That brings in Celio, who barely survives a Thunderbolt. But then he just goes for Encore. Good move, dude. After Wallace heals, we high roll with a second Thunderbolt and get the one-shot. Fourth is Sea King. She manages to survive a Thunderbolt as well, and sets up Rain with a Rain Dance. Thanks to her Swift Swim ability, she outspeeds to hit a Waterfall, which activates Starro's Citrus Berry. It also causes a flinch. But now that our Encore has ended, Starro can just stall out the Rain with Recover, so long as Sea King doesn't get any flinches or crits. Fortunately, she doesn't. So, once the Rain ends, Starro outspeeds and kills Sea King with a Thunderbolt, and they manage to do it at full health. Milotic is out last, so Starro hits her with a Grass Knot. Milotic then gets off a strong critical hit Hydro Pump, but that's not going to cut it. One more Grass Knot makes it a full Starro sweep, and wins us the 8th and final Gym Badge. So now it's almost time for the Elite Four. Before that though, we do have a final fight against Wally. Theoretically, Wally can be kinda tough. He does have a Mega Gallade that you have to respect, but other than that, not much. He leads with an Altaria, which goes down to a single Ice Beam from Starro. Starmie is a phenomenal Pokémon, by the way. Roselia comes in second, and unsurprisingly also goes down to an Ice Beam. Magneton is third, so I switch out to Carry, who tanks a Flash Cannon. Then a Brick Break brings Magneton down to their Sturdy. Okay, admittedly this could actually have been bad if Wally used something other than Tri-Attack and got a crit here, but AI is gonna AI. A second Brick Break gets that last little hit point, and Magneton falls. Fourth is Delcaddy, so I switch to Eleven as Delcaddy hits a Sing. So, Eleven snoozes for a turn as Delcaddy uses Charm. Then Delcaddy uses Disarming Voice for Piddles of Damage, and Eleven wakes up and uses Encore. So, then I switch to Xavier, who takes 6 whole damage from Disarming Voice, and then a Psychic one-shots Delcaddy. Last for Wally is his Gallade, who he Mega Evolves. But then a Dazzling Gleam just cleanly one-shots him, making us 2 for 2 when it comes to one-shotting Mega Pokémon. With that, Wally is defeated, and we've finally arrived at the Elite Four. So here's my final team, leveled up to level 55 to match Drake's Salamence. Bran the Zatu and Matilda the Grumpig are on the bench for this one, so it's up to these six to finish the run strong. So far, things have gone pretty smoothly, but this is definitely the biggest challenge so far. Let's see if they've got what it takes. Versus Sydney, who specializes in Dark-type Pokémon. Theoretically scary for our Psychic types, but we've got Xavier. And I guess also Carrie. But I go with Xavier, who cleanly one-shots all of Sydney's Pokémon. They have somewhat mitigated the massive level jump between Sydney and Drake in these remakes, but he's still not very hard. Other than being outsped by Sharpedo and tanking a Poison Fang, and having to take a Fake Out from Shiftry, this is a super clean sweep. And we win the first Elite Four fight. But next is Phoebe and her Ghost types, which are very much an issue since we don't have a Beep Beep Pony. Fortunately, Dusclops is pretty weak, and Phoebe likes to waste time with bad moves. So against her Dusclops, I go for a Calm Mind with Xavier. Dusclops then uses a Confuse Ray, which is cured by a Held Person Berry. With the Calm Mind boost, a Shadow Ball is now enough to one-shot Dusclops. Bayonet comes out second, and also goes down to Shadow Ball. Phoebe then brings out her second Bayonet, which unsurprisingly also falls to a Shadow Ball. Fourth is Sableye, who was done absolutely dirty by the fairy typing, and now has a very exploitable weakness. That is, after we take some light damage from a fake out. Dazzling Gleam is then just an easy one-shot. 
So last is Phoebe's Dust Noir, who rather surprisingly also goes down to a single Shadow Ball. I thought she might actually be able to tank that one, but I guess not. So third is Glacia, who annoyingly also has two ghost types in the form of Frostlass. These things could be pretty problematic, but first is a Glalie who gets one shot by a Brick Break from Carry. This now brings out the first Frostlass. Somehow we manage to outspeed here, so a Fire Punch just knocks her out in one shot. In order to outspeed here, this Frostlass needs to have like a speed IV of 13, or I guess a minus speed nature. I really wasn't expecting to outspeed her. That brings in the second Frostlass, and we also outspeed her too, so I guess Glacia just sucks in these games. I don't know. Walrein is fourth, and even though he theoretically should be able to survive a Brick Break with decent IVs, he obviously doesn't, and goes down to a one-shot. So last is Glalie, but I'm sure you can guess what happens to him. Good job, Carrie. Very proud of you. Thank you for making that easy. Okay, fourth is Drake. He leads with an Altaria, and we lead with Starro, who snipes the fluffy chicken right out of the sky with a single Ice Beam. That brings in Salamence because he has Thunderfang. But an Ice Beam from Starro snipes the featherless chicken out of the sky as well. So that brings in Flygon. And bless her heart, but she too sees herself on the wrong end of a beam made of ice. Fourth is... A second Flygon, which seems needlessly cruel, I'm not sure why I have to kill two Flygons, but so it goes. So then last for Drake is Kingdra, who he probably should have sent out after Altaria went down. Kingdra still takes big damage from Psychic though, and then just goes for a yawn. So one more Psychic finishes off Kingdra, and wins us possibly the easiest Drake fight of all time. So now we've beaten the Elite Four, which was overwhelmingly easy. But that now gets us to the champion, Steven. Steel types are not particularly kind to this team, and Steven has a bunch of them, including a Mega Metagross, which can hit very hard and very fast. All his Pokemon are also pretty high leveled, so this is sure to be a close one. He leads with Skarmory, and I lead with Starro. Starro hits a Thunderbolt, which leaves Skarmory in the red, and then Skarmory hits an Aerial Ace. Steven uses a Full Restore, so a second Thunderbolt high rolls and leaves Skarmory with 1 HP thanks to Sturdy. But then another Thunderbolt seals the deal. This brings in our Maldo, presumably because he threatens with a super effective x Scissor. That's a pretty generous second Pokemon for Steven to bring out, because we're able to take him out with a single Surf. That then brings in Cradily, so I switch to Carry, who sorta tanks a Giga Drain. Then a Brick Break finishes off Cradily in one shot. Agron is fourth, and has Sturdy, so we can't one-shot him. But we also can't really switch to anyone else. So sadly, I just have Carry fire off a Brick Break, which does indeed proc Sturdy. And then, Agron kills her with an Iron Tail. Rest easy, Carrie. This lets me bring Starro back in. Steven heals with a full restore, but a single Surf brings Agron back into Sturdy, and then a second Surf on the next turn takes him out. So, Claydol comes in fifth, and also falls to a Surf. Starro is just really racking up the kill count here. But last is Steven's mighty Metagross, and now things get tricky. Steven does indeed Mega Evolve his Metagross, who then just goes for a very soft Bullet Punch for some reason. Starro is able to retaliate with a Surf, but it doesn't do much damage. I then decide to switch to Eleven, who manages to tank a Giga Impact with just barely over half health. So I Encore the Metagross on the turn they recharge. Then I go for a counter. But sadly, Metagross high rolls, and Eleven goes down. Sorry buddy, that would have been pretty cool. I bring Dark Phoenix in, and on the turn that Metagross recharges, I hit them with an Earthquake, which does way less damage than I thought it would. Unfortunately, Metagross's Encore has ended, so he's gonna fire off a very strong Meteor Mash. We do have a Babiri Berry though, so we're only taking half damage from a super effective Steel-type attack. Unfortunately, Metagross crits, so even at half damage, it's enough to one-shot Dark Phoenix. That's... that's a lot of deaths. But fortunately, I can now just bring in Karen. And since Metagross doesn't go for Bullet Punch, Karen is able to outspeed and finish off the Metagross with a super effective Shadow Ball, finally bringing down the murderous Titan. That wins us the battle, and the run. And so ends the first challenge run through the Hoenn remakes. Other than the final fight, it really wasn't all that difficult. I mean, using super training for early EVs certainly made things easier than they could have been, but it is pretty clear that these games are not particularly challenging. Where they make up for that is in the Art Direction, which along with the Art Direction in the Kalos games, is probably my favorite in the series. That obviously doesn't really matter when it comes to Nuzlocking, but I did still enjoy my playthrough, and I'd be happy to do more challenges in these games in the future, if that's something you'd like to see. 
If so, let me know in the comments. And as always, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed watching, please like the video and subscribe. Or don't, I don't know. But I do know that you should follow me on Twitter and Twitch to keep up with streams of my future challenges. You should also subscribe to my highlights channel to get highlights of the challenge I'm currently streaming before it gets cut down to a video for the main channel. And be sure to join the Flag on HG community discord where you can discuss nuzlocking and contribute to future challenges. The links are in the description below. Stay tuned for more nuzlocke videos, and until then, remember to always, always, always play around the critical hit.